Okay, right, that's recording now. Word from, I've just seen that word from the sponsors. That's the start <laughs> of the recording. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, we got up and we big. You know, but big, you can go. Wow. Um, so, uh, Leah, I think if you kick, you're going to kick us off, aren't you, with a hi and a welcome, and then we'll go into some learning. Okay. Um, okay, great. Um, thank you all so much for coming along today. Um, just to let you know that we're recording the session, just so we can share it with other people that are not able to come. Um, we have today uh, a wonderful mix of our three learning groups um, that are working together to develop the Regenerative Futures Fund for Edinburgh. So we've got um, people from our End Poverty Edinburgh members groups or individuals. We've got people from our organisation learning group and then we've got people from our funders community of practice. Um, and just I won't I won't I won't speak for too long because we've got lots of um, exciting things to hear about today. Um, but I suppose the purpose of today is just to just to really learn from what other people in, in other funding organisations are doing. What we're trying to do in Edinburgh is 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 do things differently. Um, and there are other people working in really interesting and exciting ways um, across the UK. Um, I don't know if some of you attended online or in person the next Frontiers conference that Joseph Rowdy Foundation put on. Um, a couple of weeks ago in London, there was lots of exciting stuff happening there. We were just chatting before about how we're still sort of processing all of that. Loads of really interesting things around um, funding differently, moving resources, holding funding differently, um, fostering imagination um, and really thinking about how do we focus on on future generations. Lots of interesting things about, you know, tr trying to sort of have a mindset of abundance rather than scarcity. So lots of really interesting stuff going on around there, around in that sort of area as well. Um, uh, so I think that's all I'm going to say just now. I think we're just going to, you know, hear lots of interesting things there'll be a, an opportunity to ask questions have a bit of a conversation um and hopefully this is the start of of lots of other conversations around around this kind of way this sort of way of working as well um so yeah over to susie i think who's going to kick us off with introductions hi Anne. okay so we can just do a couple of minutes um those of you who are here to speak today rather than part of this ongoing design process um if we could spend two or three minutes with each of you just hearing who you are and what you're working on and um why this is why this space is relevant to you um i'm gonna go uh in the order in my screen which is sophia first hi everybody um it's lovely to see you all um, and I should probably just start with an apology. Um, this is my first day back at work um, after 10 days off being quite poorly. Um, so <laughs> I don't quite know what's going to come out of my mouth, if I'm completely honest. <laughs> um, so uh, just ask for your grace and forgiveness. Um, if I don't make any sense, um, tell me and I'll try and um, be more coherent. Um, but it's really lovely to be here with all of you. And I'm super excited about the work that is brewing um, in, in Scotland and yeah, really, happy to be here in this conversation. Um, so yeah, I'm Sophia. Uh, I'm the Emerging Futures Director at the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. Um, and um, I joined JRF um, coming up to two years ago now. Um, I, uh, before that, uh, was a, a policy wonk for my sins for the best part of 20 years, um, definitely still recovering from that particular way of life. Um, and I also um, set up a charity, uh, a, a child poverty charity in London called Little Village, which was seeking to show um, what might happen if we grounded uh, work and life in the principles of love and solidarity. So happy to talk more about those if that's of any interest. But um, I suspect the reason I'm here today is because of the work we're doing at JRF um, with the Emerging Futures programme, which is the thing that I've been uh, growing over the last two years with an amazing crew of people. Um, and we're, we're kind of right in the thick of our first learning cycle, which runs till 2025 on the Emerging Futures programme. The ambition of the work is really threefold. 
Um, one to back uh, the pioneers and the change makers um, up and down the country who are seeking to build um, alternative, more equitable, more just futures now in the present. Um, secondly, to back work that is about growing hope and possibility, uh, that it doesn't have to be this way. Um, and um, thirdly, to build the sort of resilience um, and robustness of this kind of future oriented work that we're looking to to support that is about growing relationships and deepening deepening relationships between change makers but also building kind of um evidence and i use that word loosely about um what kind of practices might help us to grow that sense of what's possible um and in terms of resources and so on, because I think that's quite an important way of understanding the ambition of the work, um, the uh, trustees at JRF have committed to putting up to a fifth of our endowment, which is up to 100 million pounds. So 50 to 100 million pounds is the commitment into this work over the next five to 10 years. So it's a significant injection of resources. We don't have that right now for the first learning cycle. JRF has not historically been a funder in this way. So we figured it would be a bit much to go jumping straight into moving that scale of money. So um, over the course of this year and next year, we're working with about six million pounds, experimenting on kind of programme design, um, funding mechanisms, thinking about governance and so on. But in order that we can then um, get much bigger in 2025. Um, and then the other thing to say is from my point of view, we really need to situate this work in the future of philanthropy itself. And that's one of the reasons we've hosted the conference. I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, but, you know, we are very, very determined to make sure that come 2025, we are not just talking about JRF's endowment, but we've brought more resources to the table to support this kind of work, not necessarily to JRF, but to in service of this work um, with the JRF uh, endowment being part of those resources. Um, so yeah, and um, that's, that's me. So thank you. Um, that I think the, my key takeaway for that is that timelines in York are probably different from anywhere else in the world because there's no way you've been at JRF for two years. That's ridiculous. And also, how can you possibly have had 20 years of work under your belt? I don't get it. Um, right. Uh, we'll come back to lots of pieces in there. Um, I've already started kind of pulling some threads together. So to everyone, before I go on to John, you'll be next. Um, the... Um, Use the chat, it's open, we want questions, we want to hear what you're observing. Um, uh, no swear words, apart from that, go for it. Um, and there is time held at the end for a little bit of Q&A and just further discussions. So um, either on either type or wait for words, but do get engaged with what you're hearing. Um, John, let's hear from you. Thanks, Susie. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here. I'm John, uh, New Economics Lead at the Bertie Percy Foundation. Um, we were established in 2018, so a relatively young um, foundation. And from the outset, the intention was to, to work on redefining and reshaping what philanthropy could be and how it works and who it's in service of. Um, and we are kind of articulating what we're doing now as looking at a distribution of resources um, whilst simultaneously devolving power um, out of where it's traditionally held, i.e. where wealth has kind of accumulated um, over the last several hundred years, um, but also wielding the power that we do have responsibly uh, in that process of um, distribution. Um, and that's all kind of set against a, a desire to um, to co-create a, a future that's regenerative and distributive by design, um, to borrow from Kate Rayworth and Don't Economics. Um, so we're looking to sort of co-create models of, of doing this, um, of flowing funding differently and governing funding differently. Um, from a place-based perspective, um, a lot of that rests in Gloucestershire, um, but we're also working with um, less sort of geographically constrained communities, whether that's in kind of uh, food and farming, agroecology, land um, spaces, that kind of thing. Um, we also, where appropriate, we tried to sort of lean into collaborations with a range of partners, be they other funders or um, individuals or organisations. Um, so at the moment, two of the the key spaces we're doing that are in the Forest of Dean in Gloucestershire um, and in Birmingham, where we're 
both those collaborations are looking at um, what climate transitions can look like in a place-based and sort of community-led context and how to fund those. Um, so we're kind of both a funder and a, a active collaborator and space holder in, in, in those kind of uh, collaborations. Um, and I think alongside this desire to build sort of pooled funds that are distributing money in a different way, there's a recognition that we have to build a lot of infrastructure and support and trust prior to, to doing that. Um, so I think almost inadvertently, that's kind of what we've been doing over the last four or five years or so um, in different contexts. Um, so we're looking at a lot of kind of um, what we call back office support, so kind of legal support, um, fiscal hosting support, financial support, anything like that, um, for the kind of organisations and movements that we're looking to to fund. And I think all of this is so far, so this kind of um, partly aimed at shifting philanthropy and the funder space more broadly. So I think there's quite an important sort of um, uh, piece around communicating what we're doing and trying to influence others and shift practice more more widely in the sector. And I think that's why um, having groups of people like this together and being able to speak here and, and have a bit of a community of practice is really exciting for us. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Uh, so I have always in every meeting I'm in, governance written down in capital letters which is definitely something we'll come back to um, and both of you obviously are alluding to what this uh, critical mass looks like around shifting the um, everything of funding uh, and maybe we'll reflect on that a little bit and and what that looks like um, what that could look like over the next few years uh, right finally James a few words from you thanks Susie um I'm also hoping when you get to your takeaways that you don't express such high levels of surprise that I've been in the sector for over 20 years uh, as well. People don't normally make that comment uh, when I speak. I think it's the heavy investment I make in Just for Men to, to dye this beard. But uh, I am going to tell you a little bit about me, about London Funders and what we're doing uh, at the moment. Um, I've just come back from 10 days holiday, so I will probably be uh, even less coherent than Sophia, who did very well there. Um, you've already seen the bio, you've already seen some information about London Funders. I think in a, in a nutshell, me personally, my background's always been in civil society, 20-ish years of those 25 years were delivering uh, services or working with communities, particularly on sort of advice, rights, volunteering, community development organisations. Um, and I've been at London Funders for just over five years, and we're a network that brings together funders across different sectors. So we've got public sector funders, corporate funders, housing associations, trusts and foundations, anyone with cash uh, who gives it to civil society in London can join our happy little family. Um, the things that I think we are most likely to talk to you about today are a lot of the funder collaborations that we've been involved in over those years. So quite a lot of what we're doing at the moment grows out of the funder collaboration we led after the Grenfell Tower fire uh, in London that brought together groups of funders to respond to the community in North Kensington, to, to mobilise funding quickly and effectively to support immediate needs, but also some of the recovery, um, the, the sort of ongoing development work in the community there. And a lot of the learning from that report um, that we did after that collaboration was about why can't funders just do some of this stuff normally? Why do you need a big crisis uh, in order to, to collaborate? One of the funders who normally in, who's involved in that partnership, who normally funds violence against women and girls work, there's a quote in the report there, you know, two women are killed every week by their partner. Why isn't that a crisis? Why don't we think about some of these systemic, challenging, awful things that are happening in communities, in cities, to our planet, and think about how do we apply the lessons of crisis collaboration to systemic issues, to systemic change in our city? We started to see some of that with the COVID collaboration. We led the London Community Response. That was our biggest one that brought together 67 funders, uh, about £58 million, pounds, that went out to groups over the year, both in terms of crisis response, but also some grants that started to look at how do you recover and rebuild and, and rethink uh, what, what society and communities can look like beyond COVID. So that was a sort of the first time we'd done a crisis and a longer term collaboration. And off the back of that, we're now doing our first longer term collaboration. So Propel is the collaboration that I'll talk to you a bit more about uh, later, which is our uh, 10 year, 100 million pounds funder collaboration to look at more systemic change uh, issues in London. Um, looking at some of those bigger challenges and working with community groups to say, 
what are the solutions to some of these? How can we enable you to develop some of those solutions or to challenge us to, to also influence policy or to think about the wider framework of things that are happening around this work? Not just how do we get money out, but how do we achieve change uh, in the work that we want to see? So we've got lots of learning about collaboration. Uh, we've got lots of stuff that's happening here. We're looking at some of the issues that, that John and Sphere have talked about in terms of power or trust or how you get some of this stuff moving um, in the sector. I'm very happy to share those. And I think the reason we're here is that we've had a number of chats with Leah and been really excited about what you're doing. Um, sometimes we can feel a bit lonely uh, down here in London and we want some friends. I know my family who are not from London have certain views about that London. Uh, so it's good to be able to speak to people who are outside of my own little bubble uh, and make sure that we're capturing different ideas and we're constantly motivating each other to try and do better and to be more imaginative and to be more powerful uh, in what we're doing so it's a real joy to be with you today thank you thanks james observing that james obviously started working when he was five years old uh, in order to achieve that 20 years he has under his belt um, and that we have our second sponsor product placement of the day which is clearly just for men um, and we'll keep introducing those as we move through this because that's how we roll right um, we're going to take us into the first question um, and I want us actually to I'll say the question but there there are Maybe I should start there. The question is, <laughs> um, what differentiates what you're doing with your work currently uh, from funding as normal? So we're trying to really pull apart, get into the details of what, what it means to try to do things differently rather than just gesture at, oh, it all needs to be different. And the things I heard already that I'm really, I would love us to try to get back to a little bit. Actually, James, your comment about loneliness, I know partially in jest, but so far and I've had this conversation before, Leah and I have had this conversation before, actually doing something differently can feel really isolating and hard and uh, can lead to burnout evidence of it here um and what what does it what does it mean to do this together not just as funders but when it like to create critical mass across the ecosystem um uh, i'd also like us to pull apart a little bit the comment around um can a systemic issue be a crisis why can't why do we find that so hard what's the difference between working on tomorrow versus working on today and why is it important to understand those differences um and then uh, of course if we can get into We've probably come more into to the barriers conversation that we'll have a little bit later on but if we can get into some of the kind of I guess causal issues that we're experiencing that make this make doing this so important um then and then lead that leads us towards some of the structural challenges that we face in order to do this that would be great um oh, there's a lot of words really though what are you doing that's different from doing funding as usual? And let's, I'm going to start in the middle, John, if you're comfortable with that. Um, let's start with you. I'd love it to feel like it's building, so conversation as much as possible. Cool, yeah. Um, I should probably start by saying I haven't been on holiday or sick, so there's no excuse for any kind of... Uh, <laughs> Incoher really incoherence, incoherence is just <laughs> nonsense. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think it's... I, I kind of joined a couple of years after 30 Percy was founded, but my understanding is that the intention was always to kind of disrupt the funding world and to do things differently to funding as usual. Um, but I think it's kind of a question that we that we're kind of constantly asking ourselves and checking ourselves against because I think there's lots of uh, patterns and dynamics that that kind of define funding as usual, um, which tend to be counterproductive or they reproduce harms or systems of power, et cetera, um, exclude those who should be included. Um, so I think we, we're kind of constantly asking like, is what we're doing like fundamentally different from everything else? And if so, how? Um, and I think when we, when 30 Percy was founded, the, like we saw difference in essentially providing a lot of unrestricted and long term which meant sort of up to three or four years um core funding for various organizations or individuals um and that was alongside less reporting requirements and other burdens that funders tend to put onto organizations so I think at the outset we kind of that was how we differentiated ourselves from the rest of funding um which I guess was quite sad in a sense that that like this seems quite a low bar to to jump over um to be 
different and and do things that to me at least as I joined the philanthropy world was like why doesn't everyone do this like this is surely just like complete common sense I couldn't understand how um, funders operated in a, in a different way and that we were particularly different in that um, and I think over time we've kind of realized that there's something like more there's something deeper beyond that which is around this question of like where does power lie in funding decisions and deciding where resources flowing and how um so now we're sort of working much more on sort of transforming those those power dynamics but also making sure that we're doing that in a way that doesn't create more problems than it solves um i think where we've seen this done before or where there's kind of an existing community of practice particularly i think we've actually looked to um to some of the sort of solidarity economy funds in the us um rather than in, in a uk context but what we kind of constantly heard there was that if you don't do the groundwork of building trust and doing core resourcing of organizations and people who you're asking to um to kind of govern how funds are flowing then you just create more problems in the community by just shifting power that they've never the communities have never been given onto them um to basically say like this isn't our problem like you you deal with this you deal with how funding is going to operate now um so i think increasing i think when we sort of decided around this idea of devolving power as well as distribute redistributing wealth we kind of i think we underestimated the extent of that capacity and trust and infrastructure building that needs to be done um i think we just had like visions of these beautiful sort of community governed funds just working straight away from from day one without any kind of um support around them um so i think increasingly how we're funding is to is to look at um what's probably relatively smaller investments in that kind of that infrastructure and um capacity building piece with the view that once that's done you can kind of shift largest sums of capital through those um, community or movement governed funds um, which I, I think that's kind of our our vision at least and that feels quite different from funding as usual um, but again it's like we, we're kind of constantly checking ourselves against that and I, I think we've we do try to work collaboratively as well with other funders um, which again like feels like a no-brainer but um doesn't happen like nearly as frequently as it should do um so whether that's kind of around uh, like a funder circle around a, any given organization um or sort of more in the uh, collective learning and sense making type type work as well um and i think i think the other thing to mention as well which is something that we're we're still doing but um, it's kind of on pause is that um to basically resource individuals um to quite a um, considerable extent so it was the the fund that we had for that was thirty thousand pounds a year um for two years um of basically unrestricted resourcing for individuals that we saw or were kind of pointed to um as kind of movement or community leaders in in different spaces um i think where that individual resourcing is done it's kind of done in to such a small um extent in terms of just the, the size of funds that individuals are given that it doesn't really it doesn't take them out of a like a scarcity mindset or position at all um so i think that's something that we're kind of interested in iterating now and looking at how the the original sort of community of recipients of that money can then be the ones who are deciding where the next um sort of round of funding goes rather than that again resting with us so it's a kind of another um little experiment i guess around how to devolve power um outside of like traditional philanthropic institutions really i don't know how i'm doing for time but i think that's what i've Got to say no, that. it's a great, it's a, it's a really useful start, actually. Um, I like little experiments as a place to kind of 
hand on the baton and I think probably as a uh, uh, principle to write down <laughs> that, that this is going to need quite a lot of little experiments and they're not all necessarily going to be the best little experiments in the world or end up being what looks like the best but they need to we need to experiment um okay uh and james i'm going to come to you next of course um i think the, the biggest challenge we've got is that nothing we're doing should really be different from funding as usual uh, in many ways i think our challenge is how do you how do we change funding as usual to be better um so what we're doing shouldn't be something that just sits over in isolation um it should absolutely as, as as john as will say be about how that infiltrates and changes and and challenges the system and how we how we bring that uh to bear beyond just the bit of money that we're giving out at the moment how's that change bigger than we want to be um at the same time just to build on what john said i don't think we should totally underestimate the importance of some of the smaller things that we get done um one of the things we did through COVID and one of the things we've done through Propel is have a single application form that connects to all the funders in the background. Um, it's unbelievable how much work that was to get done. When I arrived here six years ago and I cleared out what was called the resource library, which was just a big bookcase full of things covered in dust that no one had looked at for 20 years. One of those folders uh, was called the single application form project where somebody had got the application forms from every funder in our network and had realised that everyone asked the same questions and had risked them all up into a paper that said, you all ask the same questions. Why don't you use this application form? And everyone said, no, 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 we don't ask the same questions. Uh, and that project died. So I think some of the some of the smaller incremental things can actually be quite important because they do make quite a big difference so don't underestimate those i think it's also a bit important to think about who we're talking about when we talk about collaboration um having run organizations funders didn't know they were collaborating i was getting money from 20 or 30 different people putting it together and delivering a service or a project or work with people to bring about a change I, we made that collaboration happen within the organization funders didn't see that as collaboration they just saw that as funding um and so sometimes when we sit where we are now at London funders and say we're going to bring about a collaboration that's from how we see it but it's always been there's always been collaborations happening they've just been about how money gets used differently by different people and how it's seen by different people and I think being clear about who is collaborating and how they're collaborating is a really important question that we need to think about when we talk about what's different about what we're doing similar to to John I think the point about bringing people around the table, making sure that people are included and you're, you're designing processes and systems that make people part of the governance, the system, rather than you come in only at this bit. So we've, uh, for example, with the Propel partnership, we've directly funded um, five uh, equity infrastructure organisations who represent underrepresented communities purely to sit around the table with us, recognising that the funders sitting around the table are resourced to sit around that table. We're paying people £20,000 a year just to be our partner, just to come to the meetings, just to chip in their experiences, to value the experience that they bring to the table. And that's been really important to us in enabling 85% of the funding with Propel to go out to groups who are led by and for the communities that they serve, where 75% plus of their board are racially minoritised, deaf and disabled, LGBT or women and girls organisations. Um, and I think that's really important about the question about where does power sit again just building on what, what John said I think we've done a lot of stuff with Propel that's been about co-producing and co-designing and it hasn't always just been us doing it it's been a, how do you how do you make this part of a bigger system so in London after or as Covid is Covid over as Covid was transitioning to whatever the next phase of Covid was and um, they set up the London recovery board that brought together a lot of the key partners uh, in London and they commissioned a lot of work that went out to talk to thousands of people, hundreds of community groups to say, what are the issues that really matter to you? What do we need to get right over the next 10 years if we're going to bring about the kind of change that we want to see in our city for our communities? That led to a, a, a series of missions that were set up that were sort of signed up to by people across different agencies. So it wasn't purely a money thing. It was also about how does this influence policy? How do we think about change in terms of, some of the institutions that work with, with Londoners as well? But we used three of those missions to be the basis of the funding programmes that we did with Propel. So they were directly informed by all of that consultation, that engagement, that co-production work. But it wasn't that we went out and did it all over again, because there's a lot of people who say, we've already told you this. Uh, and rightly so, they have already told everybody this multiple times and no one's done anything about it. So how do we build together that sense of a common sense of, of purpose? And then when that moved on to the funding programme, what was different again was that was co-designed with community groups, uh, equity infrastructure organisations and funders in the room. Um, 
And again, when I say what's different about that, why is that so different? Why is that so difficult to achieve in funding as usual? But some of that stuff does feel different. And it's about how you set up those spaces where power does feel shared and where there's an understanding that power isn't just about money. There's a lot of power in community trust and relationships and the understanding that people have of the issues that they bring to the table and how we make sure that that sense of power and the wealth isn't just purely measured in monetary terms and how we make sure those conversations um, happen well so that when we're designing funding priorities, application processes, assessment processes, reporting, it's from a base that lots of people have got power here, lots of people have got wealth, lots of people have got interest in the conversation that we're going to have and making sure that that's valued equally. Uh, what that's led to in practical terms with Propel is that we're doing initially a series of grants that are called the Explore Grants, where groups are given £50,000 a year just to come up with their ideas, to develop their partnerships, to think about what they want to do, because a big part of it was a recognition that if you just go out with a programme that says, here's a load of money, come and bid for it. Again, as, as John said, that, that sort of sense of scarcity or you, everyone's just going to compete for this money. It's going to be really difficult. How do you create the environment, the ecosystem within which people can develop ideas, where they can come up with what's changing or what they want to change? And how do you build trust in those settings before lots of big money comes along? So we talk about £100 million in 10 years, and that's great as a press release, but that's not the bit that really matters to people. It's there. What's the, what's the money that we can use to bring about the change that we want to see and how do we get there? So not coming out saying bid now for a million quid a year. Fifty thousand pounds. How can you develop your ideas? How can you think about it? How can you get yourself ready for the change that you want to see? The other thing I think that's a bit different about what we're doing with Propel is we're trying to think about it as more than money. Um, we've had a lot of chats over the years in London about how does collaboration happen and how do you achieve change through collaboration? I'll just use one example of it. We had significant ongoing conversations about what do we do about violence affecting young people uh, in London and funders saying we need to do something about this we need to put some money together to tackle violence affecting young people and lots of conversations about well let's do some stuff where we put men money into mentoring for young people like, oh, that's that's good you're putting a couple of million quid into mentoring and no no yeah no criticism of people putting a couple of million quid into mentoring but you're putting billions of pounds into a policing system that's been found to be institutionally racist misogynistic and homophobic what difference do you think your few million pounds is going to make if the system is actively working against what you're trying to achieve with the young people that you're working with? So I think some of the challenge we've got is thinking about what is the change? How does the money help part of that change? But how does the learning from that, how does the insight from that lead to change in the bigger system? It shouldn't just be, OK, community group, go off and tackle racism. Of course you can't. You need a system to change. You need things to move around it. You need institutions to change. You need policy to change. You need the environment to change. So how can we use the learning, the insights, what we're doing with Propel to bring about that level of change? So it's not just constantly on the shoulders of people who've already carried that burden uh, for a long time. So what's the what's the genuine potential for system change rather than you changing a system? Um, okay. Something we're really interested in. I'm going to pause you there. Um, I'm really glad you got there. One of the things I was writing down is that um, we this, uh, it's almost like we have two parallel tracks that we're talking about here. One is about what, how the process of funding changes, and the other is what does funding, what is the core purpose of some funding, not all funding, of some funding in order to enable transition and transformation? And that's a systemic question. And that, um, whilst one is about how we do this, the other is about what do we actually want, want to do and, and what does it mean to do that? And Sophia, I'm going to give this to you and I think land, land it in your lap and let you, let you play. <laughs> okay thank you um yeah and I think that's a really helpful distinction Susie although actually they end up like this. Hand in hand. Um, yeah. So uh yeah uh what what uh, differentiates what we're doing from funding as usual um I, I've, there are five things on my list I'm not going to speak for ages about any of them but happy to like dive into any of them a bit more and the first one I think is it really picks up from James what you were just saying about like when we talk about system change what system are we talking about and I guess our starting point at JRF is um, that we are in transition we are facing a poly crisis that is incredibly hard to look directly in the face um, and that actually the vast majority of, of funding at the moment is not doing that and we I guess are trying to act from a place of what would it mean to look at that poly crisis and act from there and recognise the depth of system system change that is needed, where actually we are interested in supporting work that is about 
shifting the sort of underlying logics of our economic and social systems, moving from an extractive um, financialized economy to one that is rooted in, in some quite different values and principles. Um, so I, I guess one of the things to say about our work at Emerging Futures is we are, I guess, interested in backing work that often has a different starting point that is rooted in these concepts around solidarity, liberation, interdependence with the kind of other humans, but also the more than human world. Um, and that that means it's not only about ensuring that money is reaching communities that have historically been marginalised, but also that money is going to people who are thinking about transformation as much as equity. And we've always sort of said we hold transformation and equity as the two lenses that really, really matter to us. And I think funders are definitely getting better, or there's still work to do around thinking about equity, but you hear much less from funders about what it takes to back transformational work. And for us, we've done a little bit of work around kind of characteristics of what we think um, the work that is transformational looks like. And um, I can share a link to a blog where we, we talk a bit more about those characteristics. But I guess the key thing to say now is that often we think this work is rooted in some different starting points. And as I say, that those starting points being solidarity, liberation, interdependence, and so on. And um, I'm just going to pop this link in the chat if I can. Hopefully that's going to come up now. I'm trying to play with different computers. Yeah, there we go. Um, that just sort of speaks to that point about we've got to engage with the moment we're in 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 a more direct way than I think funders historically have. And, and, and I think once you do that, it's very difficult to not then start to say, how do we fund work that is more focused on deep transformation um, of, of our economic and social systems. So yeah, we 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 fund we fund things that are trying to do that. Um, and I guess we fund things that are trying to do that in practice. So we're interested in funding work that is not just about making the case for why we need to think differently. Um, but actually people are actively trying to build alternatives to show what it could look and feel like to start from those different positions. Um, and that will sometimes show up as um, uh, people doing work in communities. So places like um, uh, Civic Square, I'm sure lots of you have heard of, um, but many others as well. Um, and But it might also mean people are actively trying to build alternatives um, in terms of investment vehicles or new forms of governance and so on. But the point is that they're actively trying to build the alternative, not just talk about why things need to change. Um, so yeah, so that's the first one. We, we fund things that are focused on transformation and that is curiously um, not something I think many funders are really grappling with at the moment. Um, second thing that differentiates us is how we fund. Um, this is something we are, I, I wouldn't say we're there yet, but we're learning about it. Um, we, um, I mean, really, John and James have talked a lot about some of the challenges around funding practice. I know from my time at Little Village, we had a, a, a budget of a million and a half uh, pounds a year stitched together from 20 different funders. It was a nightmare. I wasted so much time on that stuff. So there's some basic stuff we can kind of clear the way on. At JRF, we're funding a learning journey where we're bringing other funders with us to go and learn about alternative investment vehicles that kind of seek to break down that divide that exists between grant making and investment. Um, we're very interested in investment vehicles that grow economic democracy, that build community wealth. And there's actually the most amazing emerging practice from around the world, not in the UK. <laughs> so that's one of the things we're wanting to to address in JRF, but um, uh, yeah, in the US, in Canada, um, some really fascinating stuff about what it would mean to move money in quite different ways through quite different investment vehicles. And that's certainly something we see as being a key part of our work is to incubate some of those alternative investment vehicles in the UK and then use them ourselves um, in, in how we fund. Third thing that's different is we're very interested, and, and um, John, you spoke to this really powerfully, I think, as well, in the need to create capacity in communities to work in different ways, to think in different ways about what might be possible. So one of the tracks of our work in the Emerging Futures programme is around um, uh, collective imagination. Um, how might we enable communities to 
expand their sense of what's possible? How might we take a, a view of progress that perhaps goes beyond the slightly narrow way in which I think certainly the mainstream media talk about progress um, here today? Um, and, and so we talk about that as kind of working in the soil. Um, we do a lot of work up, I'm in York, and um, we do a lot of work in the Northeast. It's our kind of home region. And um, Northeast is um, one of the most deprived parts of the UK, particularly children living there. Like, what is it, what would it take to grow capacity in those communities to really start to imagine what more equitable and just futures look like for them? And what resourcing might we need to do um, to enable that? So we're doing a lot of work to support uh, collective imagination practice and some collective imagination little experiments. You'll be pleased to hear Susie um, in, in exactly that space to understand what it might take. Fourthly, um, boring revolution. We, we had a panel all about the boring revolution um, at the conference. Um, many, many of the organisations that we're working with at the moment um, are basically grappling. They are trying, as we are actually, to build something new in the context of the old. And that means many of the kind of legal, regulatory, policy frameworks just don't work. And it's actually designed to kind of pull people back to the status quo. What would it mean to work um, to redesign those frameworks and reimagine them. And that's something we're trying to do with other funders, including Floaty Percy, actually, um, to think about as a group of funders, how might we resource work that is building new legal frameworks, new HR frameworks that actually support um, organisations that are trying to work in new ways. And then finally, fifthly, um, I think one of the things I was really struck by when I came into philanthropy as a complete non-philanthropy person was this sort of narrative which funders have, which is kind of we've done really bad things, we've got terrible dirty money, we've been deeply racist institutionally in every other way, all of which are very important conversations to have. But then the sort of response being, so what we need to do is stand back and give up our power. And I just think there is no logical follow through of those things. Um, and so actually we believe as a funder, we need to take a position. Um, we need to do more than just moving money and we need to be very active in curating, commissioning, platforming, being very intentional about who we do those things with. Um, but so we do a lot of that stuff. Next Frontiers is a good example, but we also convened Imagination Infrastructure, something else Susie was involved in with us um, and a whole host of other things where we really think we have to be in this work, not just standing back saying we're giving away the power. It's probably enough for now. Uh, I just want to double down on that. I work as in the kind of, I guess, consultancy ether with a number of different funders and the um, the dissonance in that conversation, we have done bad things, therefore we must do nothing, <laughs> is wild and perpetual at the moment. Like it's a really hard, it's a really strange place for people to have wound themselves into. Um, uh, so much in there that was interesting. Mary's going to take over in a minute and do some, do the next little rotation around some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, I wanted to quickly, before we do that, reflect on the fact that you're all, um, I don't know whether you can feel it, but at points you're all pointing, as you speak, but at points you're all pointing to these tension places where you're being pulled and all your fund, the, the people you partner with, be they other funders or grantees, are being pulled simultaneously in different directions, often by the same set of constraints. I think we're at a very particular point in time in transition where something that looks positive has a whole bunch load of unintended co consequences that, that puts the, re the reverse thrust on at the same time as forward momentum. And that tension, I think, is often unspoken. Um, Sophia, I know you, you guys are, are dealing head on with some of it through some of the um, specific governance work that you're doing. Um, but it, it, it feels to me like whatever we do from this point on, we have to we have to begin to take the veils away from those tensions and recognise them. Otherwise, we'll constantly be doing this sort of backwards and forwards stuff that is rife at the moment. Um, Mary. Cool. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to put the question into the chat there. Um, so the second question for you all is you're all focused to some extent on resetting or developing a new playbook for funding, philanthropy, grant making. Um, what we'd like to hear a bit about, and I think you've touched on barriers, you know, it's, 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 a big, it's a big label, isn't it, from the very small things to the kind of deep cultural mindset stuff. So what are the biggest barriers you feel like you're facing as you design and implement processes and practice? 
and also to end on a more positive note, what's helping you break down those barriers? You know, where where are you finding inspiration to just kind of smash through them? Um, I'll start with James, if that's okay. It is indeed. Um, if, I, if I do the practical and the frustrating and the annoying, and then I'll I'll move on to the inspiration and the exciting. Um, the practical stuff, I think, just agreeing with Susie on the the sort of slipping back that sort of retro thruster thing. When we did our first, when we did the collaboration during COVID, I was sat in my living room, which does have teal walls, uh, doing our first ever Zoom uh, Zoom meeting, and saying we're going to launch this collaboration, we're going to do this. And over 100 funders were on the call and people were putting in the chat box. Oh, yeah, we're in for a million. Yeah, we're in for 500,000. People who I tried to get money out of when I was on the other side of the fence for oh, decades. Uh, and there was that real willingness to suddenly. Make it rain with the money and people could change their processes. They could make things happen overnight. Six months into COVID, when we were launching about wave three of funding, we went back to people and said, can we have some money? Oh, we've got to take it through our board of trustees or oh, we've got to do this. What was that chat box? What was that low budget QVC channel that I was running that meant that you could suddenly find a million quid and throw at me? Uh, but now this was different. And that that happened very quickly for some people. For some people, it didn't happen at all. And one of our challenges is how you navigate some people who've slipped completely back into wanting to work in that way versus some people who are really trying to hold on to we want to move forward in a different way. And people are working in different ways and need managing in different ways. And that's one of our biggest challenges, one of our biggest barriers is during COVID, everyone wanted to work at the beginning in new and imaginative ways. And now we're navigating a world where some people want to work in new imaginative ways. Some people say they want to work in new imaginative ways and aren't doing, and some people don't want to work in new and imaginative ways. And we're trying to bring all of that together into one space. And that's a real challenge. Politics and egos are massive challenges as well that we're grappling with. Um, at the start of COVID, we could launch a collaboration that said, um, you know, we're going to put this out and everyone was happy to use the London funders brand. Everyone was happy to use a sort of consistent thing that meant that their logos weren't used because this could have all fallen flat on its face. No one knew how long COVID was going to last for. No one knew what the demand for funding was going to be. And so people were happy to sort of hide behind London funders as a brand. When it was successful, after a few months, everyone wanted their logos on it and everyone put press releases out saying they set up the London community response. Um, great. We're really pleased that they did. But that is much more present now. That sort of sense of who owns this, who's responsible for this, who has achieved this is something that we, it, it's very difficult to navigate actually, particularly when we have funders that do have a profile. So, uh, and there's no criticism in this at all, but just understanding the system we work in. The Mayor of London is one of the big supporters of this project. Of course, there's a political attachment that the mayor will have that means that there'll be a need to say we're doing this for for the city. This is this is my job. This is what I need to do. But that can jar with some people who want to be quite quiet about what they're doing and don't want their name attached to to something. And that sort of sense of who who's in the room and who's taking credit for something and how you navigate that can be very complicated. How I find inspiration and what brings me joy, I think. There's three sides to it. One is the sort of partnership level where we bring people together to, to front out some of these challenges and say this is happening. We have principles that guide the work that we do and we do like you're doing today by bringing together different learning groups say how are we doing on these principles? Where are the problems? And people physically move around a room to say this is where we think the problem is. And they all move to things like oh we're not doing very well on non-partisan. We're not doing very well on bold. People know what where the problems are in the system when they come together and encouraging them to solve those problems together is really important. I think organisationally, we're a really small team. Um, the sort of three of us who work on the Propel uh, partnership. Um, it's very easy for us to get dragged in different directions by the people telling us individually, this is the problem I'm facing and this is what I want you to do. And us taking time to step back and say, what's going on here? What's the vision that we're trying to hold on to? And making time to do that is really important. And on the personal level, I very nearly burnt out during COVID. It was a horrible, it was a horrible time. Um, I'm better able to recognise when I'm about to start crying randomly in the middle of a meeting now um, and to step back from some of that, but also to recognise that dealing with problems all the time and dealing with other people's problems um, is very draining. So finding personal time to step away from that has been really important. As Leah knows, I've taken up sewing. Uh, I've started making my own clothes. Not this, this is really old shirt, but uh, I have made some clothes that are not, not necessarily always suitable for Teams meetings. But finding something that's creative and inspirational and takes you away from 
the day to day that gets your brain into a different space so that new ideas can emerge and you can try and stay true to your vision. I really think the role of creativity and imagination, um, as colleagues have said, is, is really important. And trying to hold on to that at a personal level, even when you're navigating all the organisational and the, the political and the, the partnership is well, it's what's keeping me sane at the moment, my little Stinger sewing machine and knocking out some really bad shirts. That shirts fly, so hopefully you made that one. <laughs> um, the I think that's a great a great point. Creativity, you know, at the individual level and also even as a group of people is is so important. Um, Sophia, I'm going to come to you next for this question, if that's okay. Of course, yeah. And James, thanks for sharing your experiences of burnout. I I um, had a similar experience. I just shared a link I wrote about burnout and imagination and hope and the, the relationship between them because I do think it's really, really key. And actually, yeah, is is kind of where I would where I would pick up the conversation from. I think in terms of barriers and things, um, yeah, the kind of burnout and exhaustion and to some extent pressure of co-option that we're hearing about from the pathfinders, the pioneers that we're backing, um, is a massive challenge for this work. Um, people are doing this additional labour as well as trying to you know, do their day jobs, they're being held up as these beacons of hope that we're all clinging on to, these kind of lifeboats to the future. And the the pressure actually for those individuals, I think, is enormous. Um and um and I think there is something really tricky about yeah. this moment where the crisis, everything feels so urgent, doesn't it? Everything feels so urgent. And how do you manage that when it is urgent, but equally kind of reacting by overworking and running at a million miles an hour isn't necessarily the response that's needed because some of this crisis needs a response of depth and reflection um so yeah i think i think definitely burnout and exhaustion um and actually there is another there was another really good panel um which i'll pop a link into in a minute um that talks about the experience of being a kind of future builder um today and i think it's got um it's got a number of really brilliant speakers on it so I'll, I'll put that in the chat in a sec um other barriers um i mean i do think yeah a kind of complete failure of imagination about how to move money um you know a, a sort of an assumption that the only way to move money is through grant programs um or social investment we just need to like bust that out change change the story around that think very very differently about what the possibilities might be and how they might work um so um yeah definitely that's something i think that needs a lot more thought um i think i think the two the two ones i wanted to zone in on though in particular um are really around um i guess it's culture i don't know um the sort of mindset in philanthropy this kind of need for expertise and knowing james you talked about it a bit in terms of funders like funders like to they don't like to do things on their own. They like to know that other funders think it's all right too. There's a kind of slight mentality of like, if someone else says it's okay, then I'll probably get in with it. But if they don't, I'm a bit nervous. So I think there is this kind of fragility in the sector around needing to be the expert, needing to know, needing to have certainty that just doesn't serve us well when we're working in this space of transition, emergence, not knowing. <laughs> we actually need to just be much more upfront about that and have a very different language around learning through funding. So Edgar Villanova talks about this in his book. We've got to learn through funding. If we don't know what to do, the answer isn't to stop funding and figure it all out. It is to say, we don't know what to do. Let's try some stuff and learn, but be very open and transparent um, with that learning. So yeah, there's definitely something about how do you keep moving without answers? And then linked to that, the kind of governance you put around that. And I think it's very interesting that some of the attempts to um, kind of give money back to communities have got stuck on this governance question, whether it's what's happened with Baobab, um, kind of what might be coming down the line with Lankelly Kelly Chase, like there's a sort of great set of principles, but then actually at the end of the day, someone needs to be making decisions about money. So what is it gonna be? And I think we just get very stuck there. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to zone in on was around impact and the way we talk about impact. We still have this very Newtonian idea of what impact and knowledge look like, uh, this kind of what works mentality. We talk about, you know, we impact is seen as how do we define the value of a piece of work? And actually, I think there's some really interesting stuff coming to into play in the field of evaluation around needing to shift from this idea of um, defining value we did X and it did Y, to developing value, we tried X and that means we should do Y. 
and see what happens then. And so I think there's really, really interesting stuff beginning to come through that suggests we need to think very differently about the way we talk and think about impact, the way we value different kinds of knowledge and insight that I think philanthropy is a long way behind at the moment. And so that is certainly what I come up against time and time again with um, with our, our board. And um, in terms of what gives us inspiration, I mean, um, it gives me inspiration. I mean, things like the conference, this sort of jolt of electricity, of just having a bunch of people in the room. We're all working on this stuff. There is a growing network of people who I think are willing to grapple with some of the sort of deep challenges that we face. And I find that hugely energizing. But I would also say, actually, um, the other thing that I think is really important is like we are all in this work and we have to be the work as well as do the work. And actually, for me, that translates into finding space for stillness, for meditation, for things that like take me out of this bit of myself and into these bits of myself. Um, and actually, I think that is really key that we do that. There's this wonderful book called um, from the Nat Ministry about rest being a form of resistance. Like we don't want to get co-opted by the system we're trying to change. And that means not getting into this culture of overwork, not overdoing it um, and allowing for that space of stillness and letting other forms of knowledge and meaning come through from different parts of ourselves. Thanks, Sophia. Um, and also there was a, a good panel on that and um, kind of experiential way of working and actually taking that time to really put yourself in the moment that you're in. Um, so that would be another good one to share as well. Um, John, we're going to come on to you then for this question and then we'll hand back to Susie who will kind of bring us together in, in the panel and, and Q&A. Great. Yeah, I, I don't think I have too much really to add to, to everything that Sophia and um, Safar and James have said. Um, so I'll try to be brief and leave a lot of time for the Q and A. Um, yeah, I think like this kind of internal stuff, I guess, within any foundation or organi funding organisation um, that can prove a barrier. So I think like attending to how. Um, like internally we work as teams and trustee boards and um, ensuring there's like alignment and healthy culture and practices and ways of working like feels like a it can it can crop up I think I think you only realize like that a culture isn't working when things get tough like um, so it can sort of remain hidden um, for a time but yeah it feels really important I think to build on what um, Sophia just said as well, like this sense of, um, you know, the system that we're trying to to replace or make redundant is kind of is like designed in its nature to kind of squeeze people's time and resources and capacity and force people into scarcity and competition, etc. And there is a I think like the the risk of of burnout is like very real both in the funding organizations themselves but also in the um communities movements partners that we're that we're supporting and i feel like for us taking like recognizing that there's a real privilege in saying we need to to rest and like even having that space and capacity to 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 say that I think comes with a lot of guilt when we know that a lot of um, the people that we fund um, it's not a luxury that's afforded to them basically at all um, yet it's kind of critical for us to keep doing what what we're doing um, and I think I think both of you guys said it as well but this sense of like I heard it called analysis paralysis the other day. I think that's quite a sort of nice term for it, but this sense of like we have to know perfectly how something is going to work and before we even set about trying to to do it. Um, I think it was um, a guy on one of the, the JRF, uh, uh, the Next Frontiers panels, I think um, Farhad Ibrahimi from Chorus Foundation in the US, um who are kind of there, you know they're one of these us foundations who have kind of been there done that like got the t-shirt on spend down and and community investment etc um and you know he said that we're trying when we're trying to build muscles of like economic democracy like these are muscles that have been like systemically 
weakened and um, not allowed to be used or flourish at all for in some case, you know, decades, centuries, right? Um, so, um, and when you start trying to use muscles that you never used before, like you get injured, like things start hurting, it doesn't work properly, like, but you just have to take a break, work out what went wrong, and you do something differently. And over time, those muscles kind of strengthen and develop. And you, like, the only way to to learn is is by doing, really. Um, so I think just getting over that like mindset of we we don't want to we don't want to cause harm, we don't want anything to go wrong, like stuff will go wrong when we try some of this um and it's about how we respond to that i think um that's important um i guess inspiration like yeah i mean we take from spaces like this and from from community of practice both like within the funder world but also i think a lot of our inspiration comes from the people that we're funding or the, the organizations that are um that hold strongly onto the values of a, of a kind of third horizon world that we want to see and uh, um, you know in the in the hard work of building it um, I think a lot of our inspiration comes from that but also as as James I think alluded to like having a maybe it goes back to my first point having a healthy like internal culture within our own organizations means that we're just able to push through periods of difficulty and challenge um a lot more easily and with um like peer support basically and that can be internal within our own foundations or like within a community of practice more widely um yeah i don't think i've got really anything much to add on, on top of that um i um actually i have a piece of work i did with sophia the the, the analysis paralysis bit so there was a moment of real clarity for me around the difference between evaluation and learning and the fact that in the, in the middle, maybe impact analysis straddles the two, maybe, but impact analysis is often done really poorly. So maybe good impact analysis straddles the two. And in funding, the, the weight has been for a very long time on evaluation, not learning. And evaluation is fine if you need a deep understanding of what's gone before. I would say a lot of the time we don't need that deep understanding. Deep understanding. We need enough insight to be able to learn and progress, which is to your point. Sven. And that I think if we could disentangle that a little bit and, and build that into process a little bit, then we might be in a healthier place. Um, OK, I'm, I'm going to take us straight into Q&A as I'm really aware of time and I want to give enough enough time for people to ask the questions that I'm sure you great you have um in your heads um also just to flag that all of these references that are coming in i'm going to gather them together and put them as, along with the recording from this put them into that notion page we have so everyone will be able to reference both the recording and the references afterwards um any questions including from the panelists themselves from anywhere in the room to kick us off You get comedian me if no one talks and comedian me is no good in a room at 1208 when she's hungry <laughs> someone must have, zoe let's go um i'm not sure i'm not sure it's a, exactly um a question but just um i guess i've been thinking about things so i'm, I'm fairly new to the world of funding and philanthropy um about 18 months i have spent I think 25 years longer than maybe longer than than the um, speakers working in and around the same issues and the same problems from different perspectives. So I've been a civil servant. I've worked in local government. I've worked independently um, around the third sector and and other organisations. I've uh, worked in a university, um, and and it seems to take like a, about about this amount of time, about 18 months to kind of look at the same problems, the same the same issues with your different hat on, with a different perspective of, of it. And I have to say, I have found this one possibly harder than any of the, the other previous in the sense that the hope of moving into an organisation that is um, independent, is small, 
relatively speaking in terms in Scotland has a lot of money um felt to me you know kind of massively hopeful in terms of thinking okay this is if this is the last employment if this is the last kind of go at the problems before I have a B and B or whatever it is um then then you know what do you do with those five ten years or whatever it is to really really make a difference and I have to say I find it I find it really really difficult and perhaps there's something there about maybe it's easier to get lost in the civil service and the big machinery and to kind of step back and kind of think how do I change any of this than it is in a small organization um so I'm not I, I don't know what the question here is other than maybe just um just a sense of I, I can't be in any more rooms talking about transformation and it not actually happening and I and I really feel with the you know the, the the people that are part of our conversation in Edinburgh from you know the end poverty Edinburgh group um you know the guilt of privilege the guilt of privilege of 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 actually making a living out of this um is weighing hard I I'm not sure it <laughs> I don't I don't think I've got have I got excuses for not making any sense. I moved house last week. There, there we go. That's why I'm in. Oh my here. god, that's like that, that's isn't that one of the most three most stressful <laughs> things to do? That's a really good excuse <laughs> yeah, for incoherence. Yeah, but also yeah. you weren't incoherent, you were vulnerable, and yeah. that's different. Um yeah. can anyone pick up on Zoe's reflections and support with a little bit of, I guess, solidarity? Yeah, or don't don't be don't don't shout me down. Don't don't come back with solidarity. Whatever. <laughs> Does the solidarity maybe <laughs> to disagree or to give you an example of something different? Go. Well, I guess a tiny bit of solidarity with you, Zoe. I think there. Um, having spent twenty years running organisations that did things, I knew what I knew what I did. People came in for advice. For example, we stopped them becoming homeless. Um, Thing, you know, things would happen as a result of my work. And I came into this job um, and I spent two years having coffee with people uh, and absolutely nothing happened. Um, and I didn't I didn't really know. I had chats with my chair about I don't think this is my job because I can't see what I'm doing. I don't really see what the point of this is. Um, and then COVID came along and all of a sudden two years worth of coffees meant that what I'd actually been doing probably in a i had been building trust and I've been building relationships and I've been building understanding. So when, when I did do that Zoom call from our from the front room that said, do you want to be in? And that's why I think people put millions of quid in a chat box because they understood the thing. I think the bit that I've really learned about this job is the importance of investing time in relationship building. It's not it's not quite the same as running an organization that does things because there's a sort of transactional need for that organization to do things. In this job, there isn't so much of a transaction, but there is a really important point about relationships and understanding and trust. And I think there's no, the solidarity point, I think, is that there's no time is wasted if you're building trust, you're building relationships with people, because that's where good things happen uh, from. So just, just a note of reassurance that I thought I was completely pointless for two years. Um, and then we ran the biggest collaboration we've ever run. And, uh, you know, I, I got made a pandemic pioneer by Charity Times magazine. I mean that's the pinnacle of my career right there. So yeah, don't don't lose hope. I guess is the is the message for me. There's all, there is also something in there, isn't there, about understanding when to drop a relationship, right? So relationship building is incredibly important, and you know I do learning work, trust and rapport, and all the rest of it is fundamental and core. And without that, I don't. I genuinely don't believe we can do transition. But there are some times where I'm like, yeah, you're not moving, and you're not going to move enough. You are parked. This is not the world for you. <laughs> and that's, I mean. I don't mean our global world. I mean the world of transition. Transition takes a particular set of competencies and abilities, and it's not for everyone. Um, I'm can, can I just can I, slide, can I jump yeah. in very quickly? Because then um, I really, Zoe, I, I I really relate to that partly because of what I was doing before, where we were like literally delivering like baby basics to families locked up in temporary accommodation, single rooms, and um, then you kind of go into philanthropy, and yeah, you have these kind of esoteric conversations about 
blah and blah and you think what on earth am I doing um but but actually you know I also I work in an organization where most of my colleagues are researchers campaigners and policy people who are kind of holding this government's feet to the fire on issues like the essentials campaign the two child limit all sorts of things that are blighting people's lives today and when we when we first were sort of developing the emerging futures program we started to talk about the urgent and the deep work and and kind of differentiating between that that kind of immediate term and, and then the sort of longer range work that that we're trying to develop through the emerging futures program i have now really moved away from that frame because what i've come to feel is that there's the urgent urgent work and the urgent deep work now that doesn't pass my comms colleagues test but there is maybe in this group maybe you can see where i'm coming from this work is just as urgent it just doesn't have the same immediate impact but we have to we have to invest in it. We have to give it the same space, credibility, time and urgency that, that the more immediate work is, is being given. And so in JRF, we're going on this big experiment to try and find out how can we talk respectfully across these positions? Because a lot of people in the urgent space are very dismissive of the people in the in the deep space and vice versa. But we need both. We need both. And I think as an individual, you kind of have to choose where do you want to place your energy? Because we do need both. That's sort of how Thank I've got, got to it. Thank you. Your comms people also wouldn't like my, but some people need to work in tomorrow to make tomorrow ready for to, it to become today because today isn't, oh my God. Yeah, the language is hard. Thanks, so Um Linda, I'm going to jump to you. You've patiently had your hand up for a while. Are you there? Linda? A Yes, can yes, yes. Am, am I being heard? You are um, loud and clear, loud and clear. Yeah, teams and I don't get on too well, so please let me know if uh, I get lost here. Um, this for me has been absolutely fascinating because normally we don't hear from from philanthropists and funders, etc. Um, I'm part of a group called In Poverty Edinburgh, and we're just normal people um, brought together by the Poverty Alliance. Um, we come from all, all different backgrounds. Um, I know Zoe, obviously, because I too was a civil servant. And I realised that 30 years of my life, um, which I thought was a career, was actually pretty pointless because it didn't actually change much for people. Um, I think I've achieved more in the last three years within Poverty Edinburgh than whatever does as a civil servant. Um, I think that my thought behind all of this is, I think we need to remember that the outcomes that everyone's hoping to achieve is to change life for people. It, it should all be about people. Let's not forget these are real people with with, with real struggles. But there are also people who have lost, they've lost their dignity, they've lost hope, um, they're feeling lonely and isolated. And for a lot of people, it's not just all about money. Um, it's about people getting control back of their own lives, um, to having a decent job, a decent home, um, a decent quality of life. And I think a lot of the, the, the funding that's out there is sort of a sticking plaster. I'm really interested to hear about people, how things changed during COVID. It did, but it was a sticking plaster at the time. Um, the sticking plaster, I think, has come off now. And there's no one on standby with a bandage, which is what's really needed. Um, in Poverty Embrot, we always say that we we... I suppose we do work collaboratively. We want to work with people. We want to influence change. We want to hold those that have the power to account. Um, three years ago, I would never have said those words. They wouldn't have come out my mouth. Now I want to work collaboratively with anyone who can affect change. And I've been given hope today that there are others out there with the same mindset. Um, so if anybody wants to engage with End Poverty Edinburgh, real people who will feel the effects of any change that you can make, I uh, would be more than happy to do it. But I just, I'd just like to thank organisations out there that are trying to affect change. Thank you very much. 
Linda, I think that's such an, such an important point, isn't it? When you're out in, in the, you know, going about your business, doing your stuff, the world of funding can be can feel so far away and there's all sorts of perceptions, some of them correct, <laughs> some of them not, that pop up that are like, that, are, that, are distort, that end up becoming this, mm, well, A, can become distorting, but also B, become this barrier between everyone. And, and I'll go back to the very beginning. We need this to be an ecosystem approach again another of you know if you were to ask me for my principles for transition doing this with a broad spectrum of people is the only way we do this we can't build critical mass otherwise and we can't change if we don't have critical mass so having these moments where we are listening and really hearing each other really hearing the effort that's going in and where and why is so important and also just to flag that 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 offer i think more than an offer actually get us in the room, we are here, we will talk, is just crucial and great, thank you. Um, does any, I, I, I'm gonna finish on time because I have to go into a meeting with a funder at 12.30. Um, but uh, did any, so I'm gonna go to Chris, but does anyone wanna reflect on anything that Linda said quickly? Okay, let's, um, let's go to Chris, Chris. Hi, um, I was just had a, a sort of, um, I guess it's a relatively practical question because certainly um, in the past, uh, so we, we do um, a lot of work around the circular economy here, work, uh, work for a, a tool library um, and we've come up against barriers with the understanding of circular economy principles, but um, particularly um, I spoke at uh, Scottish Environmental Fund this um, network a few, a few couple of months ago. Um, and there's something like two or three percent of environmental funding in Scotland is is um, goes to circular economy projects. So there's still you know funding things at the the wrong end, as as I would see it, of the the sort of um, hierarchy of of um, you know sort of recycling and and things that do the least with um, with waste. Um, and actually, what we're about is avoiding the generation of waste through sharing of resources that already exist. Um, and so I, I'm quite interested in how um, you know, organisations, funders, particularly when we're talking about transitioning, how you help the people that are addressing or reading for applications, for example, or, or working with the, the, the groups on the ground like ourselves, that they understand that, you know, because it's a changing environment, the circular economy is still a, quite a, you know, a new principle to a lot of people and a lot of people that come in the door here, you know, with the first kind of active social, so, so, uh, circular economy thing that they will come across so how, how how when you're transitioning how do you make sure that that your staff and the people that are talking about this are, are sort of on it as well who wants to who wants to dive into that i can briefly from the from the wider london funders point of view um one of our jobs is to make sure that we're sharing insights and intelligence with our members so as well as all the collaborative stuff we do, we do a lot of insight meetings, a lot of roundtables about particular issues, because one of the big challenges we've had, one of the big bits of learning from the COVID response was that a lot of groups were saying, we spend all of the words in our application form telling you why racism is bad. You should just know that racism is bad and this is what we're going to do about it. So I appreciate that's different from secular economy, but the idea that you have to waste words just getting people up to a basic level of understanding about what you're doing or what you care about is a really important challenge that stops money getting to places where new things are happening or where more systemic change is happening. So I think where we where we spend time is actually out with community groups and with civil society groups to understand what some of those issues are and where there is a mismatch between funder understanding and what's going on in the in the world and how we can bridge that through insights through understanding meetings as well as the really important points that, that colleagues are sharing in terms of how you think about funding ecosystem and that that wider stuff some of our stuff is quite practical and, and sort of nuts and bolts about how do you really know what's happening in communities and how to understand about where you could put money differently it's obviously impossible for us to do every issue all the time and give it equal weight but i think there's something really important about recognizing that to, to Linda's point as well, you know, we're all real people, funders are all real people as well, with all their lived experience and all their, their learned experience as well. And I think the thing that I found moving onto this side of the fence is that funders have exactly the same passions, the same commitments, the same desire for justice, for, for fairness that, that I had when I was delivering work. They're just doing it through money rather than through direct delivery, but they're often really small teams and, and to put the time and capacity into learning about everything 
would cost more money than they can then give out in terms of money. So trying to get that balance right and how we can share the insights from communities and civil society groups in ways that enable some shortcuts to be made for, for how funding works, I guess, is one of the things we try and do more broadly as London funders rather than specifically in the in the collaborative space. Sophia? Yeah, I can add to that. I mean, I think there, there are no e easy answers. It's a really great question, though, Chris. And I think one of the challenges is that because a lot of this work that is engaging in kind of new concepts, new ways of thinking about um, the economy, which is taken as a sort of fixed, immutable thing in lots of ways, or something that people don't understand and stay away from, like, because a lot of the work that's emerging to experiment with it is like small, local, community-based, um, that means that there aren't huge budgets put into the communication and the narrative stuff. And so one of the things we're interested in at JRF is like, yeah, what is what would it take to fund kind of narrative work? We, we've experimented a bit with it around kind of how you talk about poverty and then more recently about how you talk about housing. But I think there is a big, big challenge for people doing this kind of work, <laughs> however you define it, but people who are trying to build the new in the context of the old. How can we find some language that feels vivid and real and not detached because I do think we're not we haven't cracked it yet I think one of the challenges we face and this is coming out of some of the deep listening and the polling that um, my comms colleagues do on the kind of electoral stuff is that we're trying to speak to a very 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 confused public so um, there are um, in the old days you could segment the public into kind of groups of like about seven groups like the most recent one it was sort of 14 rough groups but it, it, people are just it's very fragmented very different understandings of what is this moment we're in and what are the problems and what's causing it and I do think that makes our work that much harder which is a bit of a downer note to end on but I do think it's it, it maybe explains some of why it's so difficult um when you're doing the kind of work that you're doing to to, to kind of get that message through. Yeah, and actually my initial response, Chris, listening to you ask your question was I think it's a fabulous question. And having been a program grant officer, program manager within funders a couple of times, different funders, um, and with Leo one time, um, I would say that it's actually the, the people who are in, in essence supporting the decision making process within the either making or you know taking taking us to a point of decision making within a funder are hamstrung by all sorts of different processes around them it's actually they're often really well educated it's the investment committee or the board or the public or whatever yeah. it is that is is creating these criteria that are not fit for purpose that means that the decisions yeah. that you're so keen to see made can't yeah come. I, I mean i think from from our, from our perspective i guess i'm i mean I, you know when i'm writing things down there's a lot of stuff i'm i'm very aware that i'm not i'm not expecting everyone or you know it's a, it'll be a, a lucky a lucky yeah. hit that whose desk it lands on that, that's that's reading that application um you know, understand some of the more technical yeah, stuff, or, or yeah, they don't yeah. have questions coming back. I guess it's um, I'm sort of interested in you know, um, looking at you know this resource features in Edinburgh um, kind of funds. You know that that's a that's a barrier and, and a thing that that I think you know has to be you know there's a there's a piece of you know, yeah. like a, a piece of technical work that that needs that we need to think about um, and, and how we how we make sure that we either get the right people are, are, um, assessing the right things or, or that there's a process that, that takes away that um, you know, we, we, we got a, a, we were part of the um, climate assembly through the Scottish government so that was you know a um, hundred people chosen at random from across Scotland who were trained in climate science for a year and then they looked at lots of proposals of, of you know, mm, nice. to, to address that but that's an incredibly long process and that's an awful lot of people that um, so, so yeah, yeah, I'm just interested in that. Well, so that's yeah, a good. great, it's a great process. No, um, I think there's loads, there's loads, there's, you know, that could be an inquiry area in and of itself, actually. Um, uh, Leah, you had your hand, hand up briefly, two minutes to go. I was just going to say really super quickly, because I know we've only got two minutes to go. Um, uh, I wonder if, so, like, so many thoughts buzzing around my mind, but I'm just thinking about your point there, Chris, and around, um, also my experience of making decisions as a funder in a very removed way and I think maybe that's why some of the like the approach we're, that we're trying to take in Edinburgh around more localised decision making things happening in a place actually that system like so for us that system is Edinburgh but Edinburgh like as you so far spoke about like the, the deep urgent part of of what's going on in Edinburgh and and maybe that's where some of 
that thinking happens and is then kind of brought down into the the the, the, the point that you made, Chris. Um, so I just wanted to sort of make that little reflection with one yeah. minute to go. Yeah. Right. This is amazing. I never finish things on time. Um, right. But no, I always finish things on time. Very professional. Um, I wanted to say thank you to John, James and Sophia for joining us and for sharing. It's incredibly um, important, I think, for the room to hear how other people are negotiating and handling some of this stuff or not when it gets hard. Um, and also just a big thank you for the honesty and the vulnerability that doesn't always happen. And it was very moving to hear you all talk about yourselves as well as about your work. Um, thanks to all of you who came and contributed in chat and we'll pull all this together and recirculate the Notion page so you have access to it. Leah, do you want to say anything before we say bye? Just thanks so much for me as well, especially Sophia, just coming back from being off unwell. And again, the vulnerability and the honesty and all of that. And yeah, I'm wondering if we want to maybe have a kind of follow up session to talk about some of the things that have come up today um, as well like across our learning group. So, yeah, we'll follow up with all of that as well. But thank you so much. And thanks everyone for coming and, and staying for the session as well. And Susie and I and Mary will be in touch with um, follow up stuff. Thank you. Brilliant. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks. 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 Bye. 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 Oh, Mary, are you still there? I'm still here, yeah. <laughs> you know, just uh, I think there we are. <laughs> you still here? Oh, you're frozen. Oh, there you are. Sorry, it just froze there.